Today we are looking at Luke 24 verses 36 through 53, which is the, the continuation of the Emmaus Road experience and about being a witness or as the sermon is titled, the witness, because we are the witness. And we'll see as we go through this passage and look at it. There's a short story that I'm going to tell about a witness. And you need to pay attention so you can figure out what he saw and how he was a witness. One dark day, in the middle of the night, two dead soldiers began to fight. Back to back, they faced each other, pulled out their sword, swords, and shot each other. If you don't believe that this story is true, ask the blind man. He saw it too. <laughs> well, when we hear stories about the Bible, that's what a lot of people think. Oh, uh, it's just gobbledygook. It doesn't make sense. It's like this story. A dark day in the middle of the night, two dead soldiers begin to fight. Back to back, they faced each other. They say, oh, that's the Bible. It's just full of contradictions, and it just doesn't make sense. But as you look at it, the truth is there. And we are witnesses of the truth. The story begins back in verse 18, and it says, The one named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? Well, Cleopas, we don't know exactly who Cleopas was. We have his name, but he was well known to the people of that time. And he was well known to the people whom Luke was writing. And Luke writes as an historian. And he sometimes includes details that are not found in the other Gospels. And this is one of the stories. And so we know after walking the road to Emmaus, Jesus appears to the disciples. one of which was Cleopas, in verses 36 and 37. And it says, they were saying these things, as they were saying these things, because the two disciples on the Emmaus Road went back to Jerusalem to tell the story of running into Jesus on the road. And as they were telling, saying these things, he himself, Jesus, stood among them. He said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. It says they thought they were seeing a ghost. Some translations say spirit. Because Jesus suddenly appears in a room that was locked. And Jesus quickly shows them that he's not a ghost. He shows them his hands with marks from the nails. They saw him with their eyes, but still did not believe. So Jesus asked for fish to eat. Verses 38 and 42. Why are you troubled, he asked them. Well, because they thought they were seeing a ghost or a spirit. Why are you troubled? 
and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and feet. But while they were still amazed and unbelieving, amazed and unbelieving because of their joy, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish. See, with this appearance and several others, Jesus convinced the disciples that he had truly risen from the dead. And over in John's Gospel, it tells us the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. See, the, the disciples were glad. They were thrilled when they recognized him. Because they thought he was dead, but now he was risen from the dead. So Jesus reminds them of the things he had previously taught them. He goes through the Old Testament, the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms, telling of the things that they said about him. In verse 44 of Luke's Gospel, then he told them, These are my words, and I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the Law of Moses the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. See, this tells us God had a plan. And the plan was still in action. It was still unfolding. And it tells of a strong relationship between the Old Testament and our New Testament. They go together. And so the timeline here that you see is God created the universe. Then mankind sins, corrupting nature or the natural order of things, and causing all kinds of problems to enter the world. Then redemption comes through Jesus Christ and the cross on Calvary. And now, where we're at right now, in the story, it continues, and the story that they experienced, that, that we are experiencing, will only end when God creates a new heaven and a new earth. And verse 45 gives us a key. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. See, Jesus opens the minds of the disciples. We can only understand the Bible fully if the Holy Spirit helps us with understanding it. Have you ever read something in the Bible and said, I'm not sure what that means? Or, I don't understand that. Or, it doesn't make sense. Now, there are still parts in there that don't make sense. And... I've studied the history and the culture. But there are simple passages that you read and say, I don't understand this, or, or it doesn't make sense. And here Jesus explains the lessons that he had taught 
But until he opened their minds, they couldn't really understand what Jesus was saying. We see this in the Gospels time after time. The disciple Jesus does something, says something, and the disciples ask him, what does this mean? Jesus tells a parable. What does this mean? Explain it to us. And Jesus explained it to them. So that tells us, for us, we need to pray before and during the reading of the Bible to fully understand it. To fully grasp the lesson and how it applies to us. Then he, Jesus, opened their minds to understand the scriptures. If we want to fully understand the scriptures, then we need to ask the Holy Spirit to open our minds to understand it. So the first thing we need to do is pray that our minds be open. And God will open them through the Holy Spirit. The next thing is to read the surrounding passages. Because context, what's happening in the passages before and after it, are always important. Then you can read some commentaries. The commentaries are an interpretation. And then finally, ask somebody. But I think that you will gain the understanding you need with the Holy Spirit and by reading the surrounding passages. And so Jesus gives them and us the mission of the church. In Mark's Gospel, it says, And the good news must first be proclaimed to all nations. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And here in Luke we find the mission in verses 46 through 48. He also said to them, this is what, what is written, the Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in, the, in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. And because we are witnesses, we need to tell what we know. We need to tell of the kingdom of God. This is what every church must do. We must tell. But how to do it, the techniques that are used, is up to each individual church. Jesus says we must tell, but how we do it is up to us. So how do we begin to tell? How does each person begin? Verse 47. And the repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed and in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. Repentance or turning away or stopping sin as an active thing or as a continual basis because sometimes we will sin but we ought not to be doing it as a habit. 
And then we need to experience and accept the Father's, God's offer of pardon or forgiveness, which is received by faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance, forgiveness, proclaim that in the name of Jesus. And see from what they experienced with Jesus has now changed. Because they are now being sent to the Gentiles, to the whole world. While Jesus was here on the earth, his mission was to the Jewish people. Though Jesus never turned away anyone who needed help and who was seeking God. And in the same way, God, Jesus will never turn away anyone who truly seeks him. And the disciples were witnesses to all that they had seen. And so are we. Because we have the word of God, which is eyewitness, written eyewitness testimony to the ministry and things and miracles of Jesus. Acts chapter 1, verse 22, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, from among these it is necessary that one become a witness with us of his resurrection. Acts chapter 2, verses 32, God has resurrected this Jesus. We are witnesses of this. Acts chapter 3 verse 15 You killed the source of life whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. But we are not witnesses alone because the disciples and us have the Holy Spirit to give us power to give us wisdom. Back in chapter 24, verse 49 of Luke. And look, I am sending you what my Father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. The Holy Spirit will give you power from on high. We will be empowered from on high. And 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus led the disciples out to the Mount of Olives. Tells us that in verse 50, that he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And Jesus blessed them and then he ascended bodily into heaven until they could no longer see him. Verse 51, and while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. Then they worshiped Jesus and returned to Jerusalem full of joy. After worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple complex praising God. They could have stayed out there on, on the mountain and worshipped Jesus. But instead they gathered together in the temple, or basically the church, to worship God together. So let me ask you a question now. 
Why did Jesus leave the earth in such a dramatic fashion? He was there, he rose up, and they watched him go up into the sky until they could see him no longer. We don't know the answer definitely, but by doing this, Jesus' earthly ministry came to a definite end. Jesus is God. They watched him leave to go up into heaven. But he promised as he left that the Holy Spirit would come. And by leaving the earth, now Jesus could send the Holy Spirit to minister to and through all believers. But Jesus is still in control. He still knows what is going on in our lives on the earth. In Ephesians, it tells us where Jesus is now. God demonstrated this power in the Messiah by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand, in, the, in his right hand in the heaven. So Jesus now sits at the right hand of God in heaven. See, in this passage here, we learn the reality of the resurrection. And we learn the significance of the resurrection. And finally, we learn the power of the resurrection. Repentance, forgiveness of sins, wisdom from the Holy Spirit. So what are we going to do with this great news? You know, when we have good news, we share it with others. We tell of the birth of babies and, and grandbabies. We, we tell of healings and progress from setbacks. We don't fail to tell of good things happening at work. We don't fail to tell about our kids' accomplishments in sports or in school. We share good news. So what are we to do? Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized. Each of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. That's the good news that we are to share. That's the message. Repent be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the gospel message. And God is the one who will do the calling. It says, as many as the Lord our God will call. We just share the good news God will do the calling. All we have to do is be faithful in the telling. See, the resurrection accomplishes much for us. But most of all, it gives us forgiveness from our sins. And it gives us a place in heaven with Jesus Christ forever. And that's good news worth sharing. Amen. Our closing hymn, would you please stand, number 317, a charge to keep, I have number 317.